I got into the rug business accidentally. I was a school teacher and was interested in Persian architecture. For some reason, I stumbled onto a book of Persian architecture in a bookstore in Berkeley, California, where I lived. And I could not believe the, uh, the appeal of these books. It was the sort of thing where I wanted, you know, a friend would come and visit and I would open this book and insist that they look at these pictures and expect them to feel what I did. It took me a while to realize, you know, it just doesn't quite work that way. But, you know, something had hit me which wasn't going to hit them. So I had a summer vacation. I went to Iran. I bought, uh, I had kind of a destination of going to Shiraz. Uh, bought a car in Europe, traveled across Europe and Turkey. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know if I was aware at the time that you might just fly to Tehran and save yourself a lot of trouble. But in any case, uh, drove hither and yon and finally made my way down to Shiraz. And it was a little bit like there was a string connecting me to uh, uh, a man who dealt in the bazaar there. I bought a number of things from him. I bought things in Tehran. I bought things in, in Hamadan. All very interesting. I didn't know much, and so it was mostly about price. You know, usually not paying over 30, 25, 30, 35 dollars for things. Got back to the United States. And the point here is, decorated my apartment with all of these objects, and then a few months later, it was robbed. And the thieves were interested only in the oriental rugs and the trappings and the bags and all of the kind of tribal stuff that, that already fascinated me deeply. They took every thread of it. And this was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I wrote to this dealer in Shiraz. I wrote in English. I don't write Persian and I speak very, very little Persian. Um, enough to bargain and get fed and so forth. Um, his prices were really good. There was hardly any bargaining with him and, uh, and no need for it. And so I wrote to him and, asked, and had photos of the things that I'd lost. And I said, here are all these things that, were that I bought, many of them from you and now they're all gone, and I wonder if there's some way, at this distance, we can experiment and see if maybe you could, you know, send me some photos or do something, and we could work, work it out, and, and I can begin to get some rugs, because I won't be able to come back to Iran for quite a while. His response was to send me, I don't know, four or five packages of rugs uh, in what I came to call a guni, no doubt related to the word gunny, gunny sacks. These were flour sacks, and he knew exactly how many kilos you could, you could get into one of these and have the post office, postal service in Iran accept it, 20 kilos. Uh, and he could pack these things very tightly and securely. And so these packages uh, arrive. Uh, with so in sewn up cloth and there's a note in there there's a letter in one of them in Farsi uh, I hadn't sent him any money and so what's this about a friend said you know uh, there's a bunch of Iranian students the Shah sends all kinds of students to the US they have a place called Iran house he gave me the address, and so I went to a Iran house <clears throat> and knocked on the door, and a bearded man came to the door and viewing me very suspiciously and wanted to know what I wanted. And I said I had a letter from a man in Shiraz, and I needed to get it translated. And so he stepped outside, and he scanned this letter, and he said, well, you're a capitalist. You're exploiting, you're exploiting rural workers. You're taking advantage of, of peasants. And I, I, you know, I, about that I don't really have an answer, but you know, I, mean, I had a $5 bill in one hand. And 
I need to get this translated. And he took the five dollars and translated. And, and what it said basically was from this man, this Haji in Shiraz. And Haji's suggestion was that I should sell these things. Uh, I should keep the ones that I like the most, sell all the rest, make money, pay for the ones that I kept, and that way <coughs> I would make good on this this theft that I suffered, or at least part of it, and and maybe then we could do some more business. And that's what happened. So until I went to Shiraz again, I was still teaching school, but until I went, periodically these packages would arrive through the through the mail, always, I'm sure weighing very close to, to 20 kilos exactly, and we started to do business. I had no idea what I was selling in almost all instances. At that time, it wasn't like, you know, 18th or 19th century rugs were just all over the place, but the tribal accoutrements, the saddlebags, the bands that they used to tie loads on animals, uh, there was a standard of price of $10 each for those. Uh, I mean, they, things were so inexpensive. I mean, I, I bought, and then as soon as I could, I went to Shiraz and uh, made a beeline for him. And it, we started a pattern then that existed all throughout the 70s. <clears throat> I would go to him first and give him, you might say, the first crack at my, at my money. Anything that I could buy from him, I did. There was virtually no bargaining, maybe a little bit sometimes, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessary and it wasn't about that. And then he would take me around the bazaar and we would go to a whole bunch of dealers. He would skip some, uh, but he, would, he, had a route, he had a route of dealers that we made year after year. And uh, I did write about this in my first book, and I think I more or less did justice to this experience. He was an extraordinary bargainer. He didn't, he didn't bargain when he sold, but when he went out to buy on my behalf, he bargained. And he would fight over he would fight over the smallest sums. He would fight over 50 cents. And <clears throat> uh, I mean fight. Uh, I mean, just yelling and he's pulling this rug in and the guy's holding back and you know, you're writing numbers at the price on a tag and the guy's coming and tearing the tag off and throwing the tag down and yelling. And, and Haji would periodically look around he would sort of come out of a hypnotic state that is part of bargaining, I think, and, and he would say in Persian, you know, this, this, yekhane divane as, this is a crazy house. <laughs> <coughs> but he would sometimes say it in a restaurant or other places. He kind of viewed, he kind of viewed life on earth as a sort of crazy house. And, uh, but he was a point of stability in the middle of the whole thing, and uh, obviously somebody who I grew close to and loved. Um, but one more story. Uh, we, <clears throat> after a couple of years, he, he engaged a translator. He was just frustrated with our inability to communicate about nuances, and I was probably getting in, a w in the way of his bargaining skills at times. I mean, I understood something about bargaining myself, I and mean, you couldn't do this if you didn't, but uh, he was a master. So we got a translator, his name was Kashev, and uh, Kashev would then relate in English what the lay of the land was. You know, with this man, you, this, with this man, you'll just have to let Haji fight him until it's all over. You, you know, don't say anything. Don't, don't look too concerned. It'll all come to an end, and, and you'll you'll get what you want. I had. We developed a signal system. Haji Haji used words. Uh, his question was, "Oyo miha he? Do you like it? Do you, do you know, miha miha he?" And the answer when he asked me was always no. <laughs> and I knew little phrases in, in English to make it a little more convincing, 
you know, the colors weren't very good for the U.S. or something. And, well, he wanted it from, he would eventually get back to it and he would say, well, this American doesn't know anything, but I, that interests me. I can. So the whole thing was to try to get the, not, not to try to get the rug for an impossible price, because you can't, but to get it for the real price, to get it for the wholesale price. He didn't want me to be treated uh, any different than he would allow himself to be treated. But there were occasions when he would have Kachev and I completely stand away, like 70 or 80 yards away. These bazaars have long <laughs> corridors. And I'm down over there kind of chomping at the bit, wanting to be in, involved in the deal. And and so, I, you know, I said, well, what's Kachev, what's he, what, you know, we have our signal system. What? Why can't uh, why can't we be over there? And he says, leave. He said, leave Haji be. This man is extremely difficult. Haji is making a psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I once had an employee who heard this story several times. Probably come and confess to me, Jim. This morning I made a psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, it was a fantastic scene, and uh, the bazaar was just full of <coughs> tribespeople buying, selling, uh, all kinds of locals and foreigners. It was it was amazing, and, and nothing like that exists there now, and I would say never will again. Uh, <coughs> it was a uh, is my voice carrying? So so. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to. Uh, I'll speak more clearly. I found out. I saw people like Murray Island. I don't know if some of you have heard that name. Murray Island's written some books. He and his brother were in the rug business together. And they would bring things back from Afghanistan. That sometimes, I'm incredible treasures that they would. And the word was that prices were really low in Afghanistan. So in 73, I took my first trip to Afghanistan. It was just a few weeks after the king, the last point of stability in that country, uh, was deposed by his brother-in-law. Uh, and I didn't know anything. Uh, <coughs> I didn't really know where to go or what prices were, whatever, but you know, you, you just have to start learning. I remember coming out of the uh, airport and there's a t kind of a taxi stand and opposite was a, was a tank and a guy sitting up on top of the tank smoking a cigarette, you know, so it looked like Afghanistan was more or less peaceful. And, uh, I got myself, I don't know, I had to be careful not to tell too many, at any rate, it was a fantastic <coughs> scene and I soon met a man named Norshir. Norshir was a, an aristocrat. Haji Rahim Poor was a very simple man and was certainly not wealthy. Uh, Norshir's family had an estate and a fort, and uh, but he was uh, um, a deeply uh, practicing Muslim, uh, and somehow something clicked between us, and so uh, I got to be. Uh, uh, we, we became we became very close, and he didn't bargain very much. Uh, I, my partner was with me one year, and the way the way things were, he had a he had a narrow building. It was four doors, four floors, and there were carpets on all of them. And if you found something you wanted, he was busy all the time. He was buying from Uzbeks or Turkmens out in front. He was selling to foreigners here or there. He was, uh, there were rugs, 
pouring his way constantly and he was buying, there were no prices on anything, of course, and so you'd find something you wanted and an employee would come by or maybe his brother-in-law and you'd say, you know, how, how much does he want for that? And the answer was always the same. You, inter you interested in it, we'll put it, up, uh, we'll put it up on the fourth floor with your things. And, and you, you talk North Shear, talk North Shear. And so you'd, you had no idea what these, what the, so over a period of time, 75, 100 rugs stack up. And the day comes when you, you bargain with North Shear. You go up and he, you know, he has, makes an appointment with you. Okay, after lunch today, this lunch is always sitting on the floor with a whole array of, of uh, locals and people sm who just smuggled stuff in across from Kyrgyzstan or you know some visiting dignitary or whatever. So you're sitting on the floor, and after lunch we'll 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 go upstairs. So you go up, and one by one, you deal with the rugs. And there was some bargaining, and by that time I. Uh, knew the market pretty well and we did this for about an hour and in this case with my partner there North Shear said at one point uh, I'm tired uh, Jim OP you name the price I say yes or no and well, it's one thing to have someone else say you know 600 Afghanis and you say Okay, or you know, North Shear, that's hard for me. Um, and you take 550. <coughs> it wasn't a huge bargaining between us that they're often is. You know. And uh, where, where, especially where you're going to deal with one person, a deal just person just once, then you know, who knows uh, how high the prices can be. So he's, you know, so Jim Ovi, you name the price, I say yes or no. And the same thing kind of reversed. It was not easy, but, but I did it. And then he turned to my partner. And I think this is what North Shear was actually after. Because he said to my partner, Bill, you know, Jim Opie, he tired. You name price. I say, <laughs> I say yes or no. And he, he, he wasn't able to, let's just say, he, he was unable to do that. And uh, I don't know whether some illusions he had about himself came crashing down, but some illusions that I had about him came crashing <laughs> down. So, also in Afghanistan, there was a, in northern Afghanistan, I dealt with a man who developed a, he didn't have a verbal system so much as he had uh, hand and foot signals. Uh, if I like something, I was to, uh, it was on the floor, I put my left foot on it, and if it was on the wall, I'm leaning against the wall, you know, just sort of leaning. And then he, at some point, gets around to, me, to it, and he asks me, these are with people who we don't know, they don't know me, it's a raw bargaining situation. And uh, so then he asked me, do you, do you like this? And I just, of course, say, absolutely not. You know, there's nothing about this that I would like. And, and uh, what I liked was that over there. And then we would bargain over something that I didn't want. You're very good at bargaining over things you don't want. You're often not very good at bargaining over things you do want. And uh, it's true in uh, love and commerce both. But no, no, back, back to Afghanistan. Uh, so this system developed and was practiced over years. But the day came when I applied it with some, I tried to apply it in Peshawar, uh, Pakistan, with some younger dealers. And it was all very cumbersome, and they didn't get it, and he wasn't really watching, and you have to stand somewhere. And, <laughs> And so he was. He thought I was giving signals when I wasn't. And uh, over half the time, it just wasn't working. Uh, he was trying to buy things from me I didn't want, etc. And then we came to the end of the day. And we went back to a parked car. And uh, I stepped in something 
soft and disagreeable and went over and you know, uh, disgusted, I went over to a little patch of grass and tried to clean off my foot. And as I did so, the two men were laughing at me and pointing. And I said, what's so funny about this? And one of them said, left foot, left foot. <laughs> I'll tell you a very funny story that happened to my, a friend of mine, not mine, not, not to me. And I never saw the piece involved. He was in the Peace Corps in northern Afghanistan. We were there briefly together once, but he, before he left the Peace Corps, he wanted to buy a weaving. He'd always wanted to buy a local. He taught school in Mayamana. And he wanted to buy a local piece, and so he went to this dealer, and he found a piece, and it had, you know, it was attractive. Incidentally, it didn't matter to him, but it, it had a little bit of writing in it, of course, which some pieces do. And as he got involved in bargaining, and that time, in good weather at least, uh, bargaining scenes tend to move out of a store, sometimes out on the street. You have better light, and uh, it's just kind of confining in these dark shops. So he, uh, he was out there bargaining, and a crowd started to form. And the dealer offered the piece for 600 Afghanis and he you know he wanted to he wanted to pay two and then they're buying their people are laughing and he doesn't get it he doesn't see what's there's nothing funny I mean uh, in pre-television Afghanistan as I experienced myself bargaining scenes like this were local entertainment you know, you're watching a local guy deal with this foreigner. You're just going to just see what happens. You just watch. And uh, people were leaving the crowd and going and getting friends and coming back and laughing and laughing. And my friend couldn't get any of it. He understood Farsi. He could speak it. So he eventually he buys the rug for, for about 350 Afghans. And... <laughs> So a week later, he's going to Kabul. He takes the rug with him, and he shows it to a friend of his. And he said, is there something about this rug that's funny? And uh, he said, well, I don't know. I mean, what happened? And he told him the whole story. And he said, well, you speak Farsi, you speak Dari, or, you know, Farsi. Dan, and he said, yeah. He said, you read it, don't you? And he said, no, no, I don't read. And he said, well, you, you know, there's a something written in this rug. <laughs> you don't know what it is? And, no, no, what, what is it? And he said, well, I'll tell you what it is. It says the price of this rug is 150 Afghanis. <laughs> uh, this, this goes back to Shiraz. And uh, I never had anything like hotel reservations or, or even much of a plan. Um, being kind of impulsive by nature. And uh, my wife doesn't let me travel at all the way that I used to, and I'm, I'm a, I probably am better off for it. Uh, but I was, I usually I'd fly into Tehran and I didn't really care for Tehran. The prices were high there, so I would either, I'd take the first plane out to either Isfahan or Shiraz. It was just sort of like, it didn't matter to me, you know, what's the next flight out? Oh. And that trip, it was to Isfahan. So I had connections in Isfahan. And, and uh, so I spent four or five, six days there. And I spent uh, all my money down to about, uh, oh, I think about six dollars. I had about six dollars. After I bought a plane ticket for 20 or 25 dollars. So I arrived in Shiraz at uh, 9.30 at night. And I told the taxi driver on the way, you know, pool, you know, pool Nadaran, you know, I don't have any money to speak of. 